So there's no a better timing to talk about batteries uh, compared to now. So when I was invited, I was thinking, you know, what do, what do I want to share with you? When I was hired 13 years ago, uh, coming to the faculty, and uh, that was really the starting time. Uh, I learned myself and learned from my students. We uh, taught each other all the way for 13 years until nowadays. These 13 years, you have seen many great things happen. Our phone integration is better and better. We see the drone is coming up. Uh, even my two boys have a you know, DJI to play with. Um, we see a Tesla car is everywhere in Palo Alto. Um, and our parking lot at, at Stanford right here, you can see a big number right now. This is getting more and more. California has the requirement we have the renewable of 50% just in uh, a number, several years, less than 10 years, it's about seven years from now. So these all call for, what's the idea for energy storage? The top row is for portable. The bottom row is stationary. They have different requirements, but they share with the, the uh, common parameters right there. Um, these are the parameters we are looking for how much energy you store per unit weight or volume. For your phone, is this wild per liter that's more important. For your car, wild per kilo is more important. One is by volume, the other is by weight. The cost, when I started in 2000, uh, 2005, the battery cost was $400 per kilowatt hour at the cell level. And it's going down so fast, I'm going to show you the next slide. Lifetime, how many cycles it can go through, and uh, calendar life. If you don't use it, just let it sit right there. Can you let it sit for 10 years or 20 years? You can still use it. This is important, particularly for the car and for the grid scale. How fast can you charge it? Whether you can make it safe or not. This continue to be the questions you never stop asking until nowadays. Well, if you look at how the batteries work, well, let's uh, come to the battery 101. You take a cylinder cell, that's in, in the Tesla car, and you cut it open. It has this jerry roll. If you zoom in and look at this, you have copper foil, aluminum foil. Now people try to push the limit in a copper foil, 5 micron, 7 micron, aluminum foil, less than 10 micron. And this is the battery separator, right? They're separating anode and cathode. Anode consists of these particles as well as cathode. They can store lithium in, the, in their crystal structure. Once you charge your battery, lithium go to anode. Electrons also come to anode. They meet in the anode, that's in charge state. And in the discharge state, they go back to cathode, back and forth. Whether a battery can work or not, you need to deal with these issues. This determines a lot about how the batteries work, whether it's safe, how long can you use it for. And you need to move electrons. If you want to charge your battery fast, you better move your electrons fast. Ions diffusion, uh, these also involve in, uh, ions squeeze into the crystal structure in and out. There will be strain associated with the crystal structure because there will be volume expansion taking place. And at the end, the interface, each of these particles sitting into an organic electrolyte, they need to be stable. And the anode side particularly decompose the organic electrolyte and generate this cell passivation layer, so-called the SEI. This needs to be sta stable. That allows lithium to come in and go out, but not electrons eventually stop the side chemical reaction. So with this basic structure, Let's look at where we are right now. This is the existing lithium ion batteries um, and where we want to be in the future. And when I started, I told you the cost was about $400 per kilowatt hour. Now it's 130 in the cell level. It's quite significant reduction of the cost. 
energy density now roughly about 220. Uh, if you use cylinder cell, it's actually 250. When I started, it was only 150. There's quite a bit of improvement right there, but we want it to go up to 500. If you have 500 watt per kilogram of batteries, basically a, a car you drive will go 500 miles. That's roughly the correlation. So that's it, 500, kilowatt, uh, 500 watt per kilo, you get 500 miles. You actually don't need more. Um, cycle life, now we are sitting at uh, about 1,000 cycles. After that, you have 80% capacity. And the calendar life, about seven years. We could use more. We would like to go to 10,000. We'd like to go to 25 years. So after you finish your, using your car in 10 to 12 years, you still have that battery still working. Ship it to electrical grid and use it for the grid. This has a significant impact on the cost. Charging rate one to two hours. Can you get down to 10 minutes? You have heard a lot of noise in the literature saying you can do actual fast charging. So uh, probably 95% or more of the work is not uh, believable yet. Uh, because when they do fast charging, they put a tiny amount of materials on there. And doing a tiny cell, they say they can do uh, less than 10 minutes or even one minute. But that's not trustable. I'm talking about here is the real usable cell. Can you do less than 10 minutes? That's still a very significant challenge right there. And then you need, you need to be safe. We don't know how to solve the safety problem yet. We still use organic electrolyte. It can still be burned. So we know we made a lot of progress compared to 13 years ago, but we still have a lot of room to go. The outline of the talk today, I want to answer some of the questions and uh, also uh, allow you to see the opportunity right there. First one is how far the energy density can go. How much more energy can we pack in a given size of the batteries? The second one is, well, in order to make, um, can we make immortal batteries? Just never die. Then you need to understand the fundamental process inside the batteries. I want to highlight a new tool, allow us to see particularly the interface of our batteries. I want to come to the battery safety issue. Whether it's hopeless, as long as you use organic electrolyte, your battery won't be safe anymore. Whether, whether we have solution to solve that problem. And I also would like to talk about grid scale energy storage. At the end, the number five is very important. Well, given the resources we have, all this, uh, uh, the availability of different elements, lithium, cobalt, and uh, do we have concern? And if we want to deploy electrical car, go to a, a, you know, a large scale energy storage, do we have enough resources to do so? Let's look at the first one, how, far, how high the energy we can go. So the, it comes back to the very simple equation to look for a new chemistry. It's the energy equals to voltage multiplied by charge. You, need to eat, you uh, either need to increase the voltage or increase the amount of charge you store. And the, the voltage has a limit. You see the color lithium ion battery allow you to see that about four watt. You know, 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, once you hit to 4.5, electrolyte is really not that uh, stable, not mention the five watt, right? If the voltage is too high, decompose your electrolyte. So there's a limit right there. And uh, the amount of charge you can store, you can have a lot of room to play with. So eventually you want to store this charge with that voltage holding right there using uh, lightweight and small volume. In the past 27 years, graphite has been used as your negative electrode, that's NO. And it has this layer structure, lithium, intercalated into the graphite structure. This is the theoretical limit you can reach. We are above that limit right now. This very little room, very, very little room you can play with. But if you use new materials such as silicon or metallic lithium, to store lithium iron, your capacity is 10 times more. It's 10 times more. So we have a chemistry right there 
for you to have a lot of room to grow. For the cathode side, lithium cobalt oxide used in your cell phone, lithium manganese oxide, lithium ion phosphate, this has a two-dimensional, three-dimensional, and one-dimensional crystal structure channel for you to store lithium. That capacity also has a limit. They are not that high. New materials such as sulfur become lithium sulfide, allow you to store also 10x. So this chemistry is, uh, is really exciting. After about uh, 10 years of research, and explore broadly what type of chemistry they are attractive for the uh, transportation for the grid scale. If you're looking for the chemistry that I can have practical, I'm mentioning practical, not theoretical, high energy, this might be the pathway we have to follow. And the, uh, nowadays, still graphite combined with a nickel manganese cobalt oxide that's here, XYZ, different ratio. And the maximum you possibly can reach is about 250 watt per kilo. And with silicon, replace graphite coming in, you get to 400. <coughs> and metallic lithium coming in to replace silicon, you might get to 500. And then sulfur coming in, replace MMC, combined with lithium metal, you could reach potentially 600 to 800 watt per kilo. We have chemistry allow you to uh, have a runway of, of 3x in a practical sense. But this could take 10, 15 years in a practical sense when you see this technology coming out. Um, so the reason is the following. <coughs> this is a slide I asked my student Ya Yuan to make. Um, this is the relative volume change. I plot it in a way is a lithium versus the host atom, host lithium. You notice that the materials used in current technology is one lithium, six carbon. So lithium to carbon ratio is one to six. Lithium cobalt oxide roughly use half of the lithium. The ratio is one to six. Lithium ion phosphate is also about one to six. The volume change right here is about 10% or less, very small. As soon as you store a lot of lithium into host, these different materials really start to show up. However, the amount of volume expansion you have increased tremendously. This is the one of the fundamental reasons to use the high capacity material is so difficult. It caused the following problem. Past 27 years, we have stable host to host this lithium. New materials can store a lot more lithium, has the problem of uh, chemical bond breaking. So many lithium and so many electrons coming in, store in the structure, you have the bond breaking. Atoms are moving all the time for these host materials. Very large volume ex uh, structure change, big volume expansion. So you need completely new, completely new ideas. How do you handle the materials issue in order to make these uh, materials workable inside your phone, inside your car? So my group started to work on this to tackle silicon problem. Silicon has 11x of the capacity of graphite. Volume expansion is four times. It causes breaking because it expands too much. And also the interface on each of the particle surface is not stable. How do you address that problem? It wasn't known. So let me show you this uh, video. It's quite dramatic. This is the one, a silicon nanoparticles inside TEM. We are doing in situ measurement, charge up this particle with lithium. It's 800 nanometer in diameter to start with. And you see silicon volume expansion. And after a while, you know, this particle eats uh, too much lithium. And it's going to uh, get broken. And this breaking and cause the failure of the battery materials. The first time you charge out your battery is already dead. So that's a challenge we are facing. So using a technique like this, we could identify what's the critical breaking size. After you have the particles smaller than those size, they won't be broken anymore. 150 nanometer is about the size. And with this understanding, um, uh, my group has been through uh, 11 generation of design. And uh, this was the first generation. Uh, we start from silicon nanowires 
They have small diameters, volume expansion can happen, but they don't break anymore. We solve the breaking problem. This, indeed, this paper started the whole research field of uh, you, using uh, nanotechnology for energy storage, uh, starting from this paper. Uh, we go to the core shell design. And using a stable core to stabilize the whole structure is getting better. Hollow structure design, so you can have interior hollow space and having more volume to uh, relax the strain. And, and, and we have been through now uh, 11 generation. Each generation, we try to solve one problem. And you can see uh, this all stacking up, all this learning. Uh, now start to build up the uh, material design principle for industry to use and eventually to solve the problem of uh, volume expansion, breaking, and instability of uh, a solid electrolyte interface. So this has uh, resulting in a, a company, a startup founded about 10 years ago, uh, now having uh, the real batteries in the market, used in the phone, in the drone, uh, soon will go into the electric car. And the energy density, 300 watt per kilo, the uh, generation, uh, the uh, manufacturing line one design, uh, and our China uh, plant, and the line two reach uh, about 400 watt per kilo. Uh, this is a lot more than uh, what uh, you know, graphite anode can offer. So this is our manufacturing plant in uh, Wuxi City in China. Uh, 2016, we have the, uh, the whole board of directors visiting the, the plant, having a celebration. So this is going uh, with uh, uh, high promise. This could go into the electric car uh, in a big way. So what's next after that? I'll show you the roadmap. Eventually, we want to make lithium metal to work. In 2016, the White House announced the Battery 500 Consortium. Uh, this, is, this is a consortium under Department of Energy. Uh, providing uh, 15 uh, million dollars for uh, 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 five years, let's try to generate 500 watt per kilogram of batteries. The uh, PNNL National Lab, together with uh, Stanford Slack, are the co-lead of this consortium. Uh, we have a very strong team of people uh, uh, from uh, multiple institution try to uh, address this challenge. Now we need to come to lithium metal, metallic lithium. Um, I show you metallic lithium can potentially offer as an anode combined with uh, nickel manganese cobalt oxide and with sulfur with a 500 watt per kilogram or higher energy density. And you look at half a century ago and uh, before I was even born and lithium uh, battery really started from lithium metal anode. However, it, it was too challenging. People didn't know how to solve the problem. That's because if you start from a lithium metal anode, it's so reactive with organic electrolyte. It forms an interfacial compound, SEI, right away. And then you, once you charge out your battery, you need to play lithium onto this lithium foil. There's no guarantee this interface will be flat during plating. You are going to change the surface topology. This will stretch your SEI layer, will make a crack or multiple cracks on the surface. This nuclear hot spot, you will grow this filament out of this hot spot. This filament grow longer and longer can uh, make the battery shorting, happening, punches through the separator and make the battery catching fire and explosion. That was indeed a major challenge. You have seen past 10 years multiple battery instance. Many of them are related to this lithium, metallic lithium dendrite growth, cause the battery catching fire. And then when you play, uh, strip the lithium during this charge, there's no guarantee it will come from the tip. It might go to the bottom. Then you're going to cause this filament of metallic lithium detached from the uh, underneath lithium foil. You use lithium metal very fast. The cycling efficiency is very low. You build up this so-called dead lithium. The battery also die very fast. So for the realistic battery, for unit area per centimeter square, you need at least 3 milliamp hour of capacity. That translates to 15 micron thick lithium metal. So every time you play lithium metal, you play 16, uh, 15 micron thick. You strip away, it goes back to zero. 
Then this 15 micron thick, and each layer is just too large for battery cell to handle. We have summarized all this learning uh, and this uh, uh, perspective paper in Nature Nanotechnology. We combine what people learned in the past 50 years and what we learned in our group. And we pointed to the community, we said, the root cause of the problem is actually in the center. Outside is the surrounding phenomenon. The center problem is high chemical reactivity of lithium coupled together with relative infinite volume change during uh, plating and, uh, and stripping up and down. This process makes it very hard to handle. So uh, this causes all this problem outside. About five years ago, uh, Steve uh, come back to Stanford. He and I have a meeting. We brainstorming a lot of ideas. How do we solve this problem? So we come up strategy, how do we stabilize the interface to overcome the high chemical reactivity problem at the interface? We uh, also point to the community and say, not only chemically need to be stable, at the same time, mechanically needs to be stable. Otherwise, it's plating and stripping. Keep changing your interface, putting a lot of stress onto your interface. You better find an interface that's chemically and mechanically stable. And after that, we, see, we saw it's not enough because of this 15 micron lithium plating in and out. It's just too dramatic. We need to build a stable host, hosting metallic lithium inside, and together with a few other strategies. Let me highlight this host idea. What's the host idea? Uh, this was done by a graduate student, Ding Chang, who is sitting right there. Uh, we want to build a host hiding this metallic lithium into domain inside this red color host. If you strip lithium away, this whole structure remains stable and holding the whole volume right there and make it possible to have an interface you can build. And then when you play lithium, it plays into this host. So Ding Chang de uh, developed a very clever concept. Um, so we wanted to use metallic lithium in the molten state, melt the lithium, embed it into a host. We search carbon nanotube film, film as the host. You see this molten lithium, they form droplets, they don't wet. And we try all types of substrate until we try to reduce graphene oxide. Now you see the lithium melt and wet and go into the structure right away. So we recognize, uh, similar to water, and water, we have hydrophobic and hydrophilic to describe whether can water can wet a surface or not. Now we invented a new term. We call this as uh, lithophobic or lithophilic to describe the lithium wetting behavior. So the reason graphene oxide can wet is this polar functional group of OH, COOH. Compared to the graphene or regular carbon, you don't have enough of this uh, polar group. The polar group will react with lithium. These uh, protons will be given away. So the reaction of the free energy delta G be between lithium and graphene oxide, this surface reaction gives you negative delta G, driving the reaction happen. And that really means this uh, lithium metal really like the surface of graphene oxide cause the wetting uh, phenomenon taking place. <laughs> we reduce graphene oxide 8% by weight only stacking into a, a layer structure by filtration process. And uh, putting into molten lithium, it react with, uh, 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 molten lithium react with a graphene oxide. And generally a little bit of hydrogen bubble, right? This will you know, open the, uh, the spacing between the gap. And, uh, and the wetting happened, the molten lithium will wet into the graphene oxide and hiding now between the two graphene oxide. Graphene oxide in this regard is the whole structure for the lithium uh, uh, metal. And after this processing, this is flexible, just like a metallic foil. So this could be used uh, using the existing battery manufacturing machine. You can process that. So now let's look at the deposition behavior. This is with, with reduced graphene oxide. After deposition, the surface looks smooth. If you deposit lithium onto copper foil, it forms this dendrite. So we don't have those dendrite formation. This made this lithium foil 
inside the graphene oxide, a lot more stable, a lot more sa uh, safer. And as we said, um, and these type of uh, 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 lithium into the graphene oxide, lithium metal hiding between, you look at the cross section of this whole film, and you strip lithium away completely, it only shrinks its thickness by about 20%. So it's now a lot more stable instead of, instead of becoming uh, completely empty. You have a whole structure that could stabilize this metallic lithium. You place it back, it comes back to the initial uh, thickness. Uh, these are uh, uh, making these uh, uh, plating and stripping. This is the voltage profile. This is a smaller one, tells you it's stable. The blue color is stable. The red color is the regular lithium foil. The voltage open up is telling you you need to use high and higher over potential. It becomes less and less stable. So we have now a solution that's a lot more stable. Uh, the searching of the host continue. And the last year or two also, after graphene oxide, we have been able to identify a number of uh, very promising host materials. Now, minimize the volume change of the whole electrode. Now it's a virtually zero change. Down, that really provides a stable materials platform. You could now play with interface, make this lithium metal better. So that was the first topic. I want to select the uh, uh, one example to share with you. Now let, let me come to the second one. So battery seems to be a black box. It has been a black box. It is still to a large de degree a black box. Why it can still work, be working? And we didn't have a full picture of understanding down to atomic scale, how the batteries work. So it's been about more than 10 years. I have been always thinking, can we really uh, using our TEM transmission electron microscopy to look at the batteries. However, for most of the battery materials, that was not so uh, useful because lithium are moving all the time. And these battery materials, you look at the anode, they're so reactive chemically. They react with the moisture, with oxygen, and also their melting point is usually very low. As soon as you focus electron beam onto your battery materials, they evaporate. So it's really hard. Uh, last year, you have seen this announcement. In October 2017, uh, Nobel Chemistry Prize was given to uh, these three uh, gentlemen. They invented, they advanced the uh, cryogenic electron microscopy technique for starting the biomolecule, try to solve the protein structure, for example. The cryo-EM in the past 10 years has a lot of advancement. Um, it used liquid nitrogen or other uh, really uh, cold liquid to cool down your biomolecule, make it more stable. And also this is a very sensitive detector can detect the signal with very small dose of the electron what can already image the protein and, uh, and DNA, RNA and so on. And uh, this is, was the technique. My group uh, have been uh, used for about two years now. And uh, two, roughly two years ago, I recognized what well, biologists developed this, such a cool tool. It might be very useful for the battery research. And these two uh, students were the hero. And uh, I talked to them. I said, you guys stop your current project. Let's, uh, 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 let's uh, work on a Manhattan project, right? Just complete new stuff. I don't know whether it's going to work, but it's worthwhile to spend a year or two of your uh, graduate uh, uh, life. Uh, with me to explore this area here. Here is what they develop. And uh, we deposit, for example, metallic lithium filament onto a TM grid and put into liquid nitrogen without exposed to air and really cool down this very fast. You stop your uh, uh, chemical reaction in liquid nitrogen. That's at a temperature of 77 Kelvin. And uh, they develop a uh, a transfer technique going to transmission electron microscope without exposing to uh, the air, without leaving the liquid nitrogen temperature. So it took, uh, took them a while to, to do it. Um, so after several months, we have really surprised data. This is a lithium metal filament. Using this cryo-EM technique, we could image 
in the past, as long as soon as you image your um, uh, metallic lithium film, it looked like dark color. The reason is this lithium metal already react with the moisture in the air, even with a, a second exposure. And that's the end of the world, right? That uh, will cause it become black. That's, lithium metal should look like this very light contrast because it's uh, element number three, small atomic mass. It shouldn't have that much contrast under electron microscope. And this has already become lithium oxide, lithium carbonate. This is a standard TEM. You focus the electron beam, you see you drill a hole into this structure right away. So you cannot image them. Now with a cryo EM, you can look at the structure for one minute, five minutes, and 10 minutes. They still remain the same. And using an analytical tool called EOS, and uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy, we can confirm this is a metallic lithium we are looking at. Instead of lithium ion, it's metallic lithium. Um, this is very exciting image. When my students show to me, me, I say, wow, this is just amazing. This is first time anybody can see atomic scale image of metallic lithium. Lithium metal is only 180 degrees C melting point. The bonding between lithium and lithium atom and metallic lithium is very weak. So now it's possible to look at this uh, atomic scale uh, resolution. And now we can even look at a long visual direction crystallographically. Metallic lithium can grow. This allows you to study the growth habit eventually, provide information to solve the lithium dendrite problem. We discover along 111 direction, it's 50% of the dendrite like to do so. Uh, along 211, 30%, 110, 20%. This has a, a reason why along certain direction is more, because the sidewall surface tend to terminate with a particular direction of a crystalline surface, 110. That's the lowest energy surface that actually can explain this uh, behavior. There's also a long outstanding issue in the battery research field. That could determine the battery safety to a very large degree. That can also determine the battery life, how many cycles you have, how many years it can, your battery can run. That is actually the interface, solid electrolyte interface. There were two models proposed in the past couple of decades about what are the structure at the surface, the interfacial layer of these materials. There's a multi-layer model, there's a mosaic model. Mosaic model means uh, in this interfacial layer, you have inorganic nanoparticles of decomposition compound em embedded into the organic matrix of polymer. So indeed under this e so-called so ECDC electrolyte, we can identify uh, um, this is schematic drawing of a nanoparticle of lithium oxide, lithium carbonate, embedded into this green color, amorphous matrix of polymer, decomposed and formed through this by this electrolyte. We can identify, if you could see this image clearly, a projection in the screen, atomic scale resolution, identify these inorganic particles into organic matrix. However, we have also seen by adding the additive, so-called FEC, into the electrolyte, um, we can see the multi-layer structure of uh, SEI as well. In this case, if it's inorganic of lithium oxide on top of the uh, amorphous matrix, of this polymer. And these are very two different structures of solid electrolyte interface. Um, and this discovery is indeed different from the initial multi-layer model people propose. And initial people propose is the inorganic layer is underneath of this amorphous polymer matrix. So we see the opposite. So you say, why this is important? Why this is important? And the uh, recent data unpublished yet uh, by my uh, talented graduate students that are sitting right there, they see these two different morphology and they give you a different interfacial impedance, resistance to the ion movement. That will change how the battery material, such as lithium metal, how they plate, what's their morphology. 
And that can change the efficiency of the plating and stripping. So for the columbic efficiency, that can determine your battery cycling life can be long or short. So the ability to understand this and to correlate the structure with electrochemical performance, eventually, hopefully, we can design artificially a very nice interface, probably allow us to make the battery run much longer uh, cycle life and calendar life. So I want to touch the uh, third topic uh, about the battery safety. It's still hopeful you can make the battery safe. We know battery inside has organic electrolyte. You have seen the instance over the years, where this airplane to the very small you know, phone devices a couple of years ago, or no seven. Uh, this happened periodically. Every once, every two years or so, you always see a big instance coming in. And this instance usually come from a reason you have a battery cell. It could be external, it could be internal. You have some type of shorting happening. So there's many reasons can cause this shorting. And externally, you have accident. The outside force, you know, bump into your batteries can cause the shorting. Internally, you might have defect. You might have, charge, have charged your batteries, overcharge. And you might charge in the cold weather, low temperature. And internally, can grow a lithium dendrite. No matter what's the reason, this will cause fast release of the battery electricity. The battery started to heat up. At about 100 degrees C, roughly this range, the interfacial layer of your anode will start to have exothermic decomposition. That's why I was telling you as SEI is quite important, this interfacial layer can affect your battery safety and your cycle life. Um, and the temperature keeps going up because you are releasing uh, more and more electricity. About 180 degrees Celsius also, exothermic reaction between the cathode oxide and your electrolyte start to happen. And this will quickly heat up your battery to 300 degrees C, 400 degrees C, 600 degrees C. This is called thermal runaway. So at this moment, it's very hard to stop. Nearly impossible to stop the reaction. So this thermal runaway can uh, cause the battery catching fires. And the worst cases will be explosion happen. Uh, looking at this issue, we have been uh, uh, trying to come up with a new solution to prevent at each stage of the problem. Let me share with you uh, with three ideas. One idea is if you have internal plating of metallic lithium, can you inside this battery separator, this positive electrical cathode anode, this is uh, separated, the yellow color. In the middle, this uh, red dashed line is a metallic, about 100 nanometer or 200 nanometer, very thin coating put in the middle. And instead of having two electro, let's have three electro for each battery cell. If you have a shorting happening, grow halfway. You detect this middle layer with your anode. You see the voltage goes to nearly zero. That tells you the, the shorting is coming. It's halfway. You better stop your battery charging and uh, don't use your battery anymore. So make it safe. So that's our solution number one. Uh, these can help addressing the problem of plating. If your battery has manufacturing defect and that can cause the plating halfway, let's stop using it. The second one is, what if you cannot prevent that? Your battery has to heat up. Then you need to have a fire uh, extinguisher mechanism going in. And we can uh, put fire retardant encapsulated into this polymer, for example. And you, you can put in this green color, fire retardant encapsulated into the polymer. The polymer's melting point can be engineered to the temperature you want. For example, 100 degrees Celsius, around that. If you get to that temperature, the polymer melts and then release this fire retardant. So you can uh, prevent battery catching fire. We have also worked with uh, uh, Professor Jinan Bao in chemical engineering to, to say, well, let's find a switching mechanism to make the battery safer. If you have a shorting happening in one of these current collector, we have a polymer layer 
with a, a nanospike of nickel embedded inside, and room temperature is conducting. But if your battery heat up to high temperature, this polymer volume expands and pull the nickel nanospike, a lot of this particle open, so the whole layer become an insulator. Made the release of the electricity very hard, so you don't heat up your battery that much. You have a thermal switching, can control that to about close to 100, uh, 100 degrees Celsius also. And this uh, electrical conductivity going from metallic to insulator at a controlled temperature. So in a small cell, these three mechanisms work reasonably well now. We try to explore this for the large cell used in your phone and your, and your car. And, and these are three ideas adding together might, might make your uh, battery much safer. Um, I would like, like to come to the fourth topic, grid scale storage. This is completely different. Grid scale storage compared to the uh, transportation batteries it does not require high energy density. In principle, it does not require. But you cannot also go to ultra small energy density. It won't work from the cost consideration. Also from the uh, consideration of the real estate, the land it occupies, it will not work either. You still need certain energy density. I want to share with you a couple ideas uh, on this topic. We know grid scale energy storage is so important for us to integrate solar and also wind into the electric grid. It helps us to stabilize the grid for us to have a much smarter grid. At Stanford right here, we have bits and watts initiative. It's exactly trying to deal with, to reconsider how we do, uh, do the grid. For the grid scale storage, this opportunity for the batteries to contribute to smooth out the fluctuation from seconds to minutes to hour, and also to do the peak shifting, you know, store electricity uh, when there's a lot of generation, not that much use, and then use it later uh, when you have a, a peak use, and from hours to day. And also seasonal storage. We have a lot of solar during the summer time, but not in the winter time. And certainly seasonal storage is a lot harder. The easier one to start with could be these uh, seconds to minutes to hours. The more cycle of the battery you use, the better for the uh, batteries in terms of the cost consideration. Seasonal storage, you use it about one to two cycles per year. So that's not a good use of your battery from the cost. For the, probably the largest application is in the peak shifting. Let's look, look at the current storage. It's still the pumping the water. It's the most low cost one for storage. And due to the elevation difference, pumping it during the electricity storage and use it and then flow the water down. This has the location dependence. Uh, uh, the, uh, you know, getting the permit will be very hard. Uh, this has limited use right there. Let's look at the grid scale storage. What, how, how big of scale that could be? Um, several years ago, when I gave the talk right here in the energy seminar, our annual production of lithium-ion battery is only about half of this size. 2017, the data will come out soon, but I will predict it's about double, about four years ago, 70 gigawatt hour. But in California alone, for grid scale storage, we probably need 50 gigawatt hour easily. We need that. And you put the whole year production, you know, it just barely can satisfy a California need for the lithium ion. And, and how many batteries we need right there? We need this uh, Stanford Stadium, the football stadium, fill to half of these batteries. That will be sufficient for us to use. Uh, it's a big problem. So this idea, you know, can we consider um, different idea for the storage. Um, if you look at now, what are the options? Actually, lithium ion is still a very strong contender. With the cost going down so fast, no other batteries have lithium ion's performance and cost yet. Lead S is a, a very low cost. However, lead S only has three to four years lifetime. And lithium ion is longer. And flow battery has been considered is this a liquid 
consists of uh, 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 redox molecules. You can charge up this uh, uh, redox molecule by flowing one way and discharge and flow it back. Uh, vanadium redox is well known. At this moment, it's still high cost. Membrane cost right here is very important. That's an ion selective membrane. Doesn't allow the redox of these uh, 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 ions to go through, but only the protons. It's a high cost. And also the energy density uh, is low. For this redox molecule, solubility is not enough. You're talking about 30 watt per kilo. That's uh, about seven times lower than lithium ion. With all the controlling electronics going in, the system level cost, lithium ion now is about 250 watt per kilo, uh, sorry, per kilowatt hour, 250. And a redox flow is about 400. 500 range is still too high. Um, so if you could increase the energy you store, you can reduce the cost. A uh, number of years ago, we showed lithium polysulfide has much higher solubility and compared to vanadium, that's 1.7 molar, and a lithium polysulfide can have uh, even 5x more. So you increase the amount of energy you store, you reduce the cost. And we invented this uh, technology with a metallic lithium anode. So you have a solid, you have a liquid. They react by themselves, forming this cell decomposition compound, the SEI. That's your membrane. So you don't have to use other membrane. It reduces the cost. This still remains as a very attractive idea of a semi-flow batteries to, uh, for the grid scale storage. We show this can cycle for a uh, 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 you know, uh, thousand cycle type of range, still going. I also want to highlight, uh, in the last year or two, uh, also, uh, my group uh, just uh, uh, started a new project and looks very promising. Uh, Wei Chen is a postdoc in the group uh, working on this project. And we look at what might be the possible choice it turned out to be these could be an attractive solution for grid scale. It's a nickel hydrogen gas batteries. Let me clarify, it's not nickel metal hydride. It's a nickel, the same as nickel metal hydride, but the hydrogen is different. Nickel metal hydride using hydrogen store and the alloy, here we only use gas. And basically if one is solid electro, that's a nickel oxyhydroxide and nickel hydroxide cycling back and forth during charging. But the anode is hydrogen and water. And building up this battery is simple. So it's uh, taking the uh, uh, nickel hydroxide and water and putting the catalyst for the hydrogen and into this electrode. You build it up in the discharge state. Once you charge it up, you generate hydrogen gas and put it into a tank. So it's also an idea of semi-flow battery, half is solid, the other is half is gas. You only have flow the other half, very simple construction. And this has the uh, very long cycle life. This show you uh, more than uh, 1200 cycles without decay. It's uh, about 1.3 watt aqueous solution batteries, very low cost. And these uh, have showed this uh, quite uh, 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 amazing performance. For aqueous system, this can potentially get up to 130 watt per kilogram. And the lead acid is only 30, 40. The usual redox flow is about 30, 40. This you are talking about three times higher. And the volumetric is it's not bad. The key thing is we think the cycle life can go to 10,000 cycles. We have done the a limited a couple thousand cycles, virtually without decay. And this is extremely important calendar life could be 25 years. How do I know that? After we invented this, Wei and I searched in the literature, we say, let's see whether people have worked on this before. It turned out to be tens, a few decades ago, and NASA, NASA used this chemistry for the satellite. So you go to the satellite, if you don't have 25 years, you are not allowed to get into satellite. And but why, for, why did we forget about this battery chemistry? That's because at that time, the anode part using platinum as catalyst, that's high cost. Now we have different catalysts for our hydrogen electro, made the whole batteries much lower cost. These can potentially get down to these uh, $50 per kilowatt hour type of range. 
So this offer a very attractive solution for grid scale storage. Eventually, we are looking for $100 per kilowatt hour. So this is a good starting point. Uh, in the last few minutes, let me mention uh, the issue of the resource availability for the batteries. Let's mention the, the lithium first. I showed some of this slide before. We have a uh, 40 million ton of uh, global reserve for lithium. Uh, this is going up, this number. Is this it now? Are we worried about the availability of lithium? So let's do a little bit of analysis. This 40 million ton, it's enough for us to make a 10 billion Nissan Leaf. And uh, if you drive Tesla, uh, that will give you a 3 billion Tesla. That sounds still not enough, right? We have about a billion cars running in the world right now. And, but don't forget, we have uh, virtually infinite amount of lithium in the ocean. Uh, indeed, looking at this number, Steve Chu and I recently started a project to extract lithium out of ocean. And now it looks uh, quite uh, promising. And we could do that. We can uh, beat sodium chloride in the ocean and take lithium out. And the cost is not quite meeting the cost of, uh, from this reserve, reserve yet. But as long as the lithium concentration increase slightly, and it doesn't need to be uh, those uh, very salty lake having a lot of high lithium concentration, just a little bit higher than the ocean, we will be economically viable. So I think this issue potentially can be solved, the availability of lithium. But I do want to point out, you know, what, what are the uh, possibilities for the grid scale with the current lithium reserve. Our electricity consumption about five terawatt, maybe a little bit higher now. Uh, to store four hours of the uh, electricity of the whole world, we need about 16 terawatt hour of uh, batteries. And uh, our 40 million ton for, it's enough for us to make 240 terawatt hour. In that regard, we still have a lot of lithium. But I still need to warn you, lithium is not just used for batteries. It's used for aircraft as well. It consumes a lot more lithium than a battery to make lightweight, uh, lightweight alloy. So let me show you how sensitive the lithium price could be. In the last several years, starting from 2015, China announced the electric car, significant support for the electric car program. And the uh, lithium price go up tremendously after that. And there's a large number of electric cars sold in the past couple of years. You can see 5x price increase. We are still not running the shortage of lithium yet, but these uh, you know, demand and supply issue can drive the price in a very sensitive way. Let's also look at the issue of other important elements inside the batteries. And now using graphite, cathode and the current technology using uh, uh, lithium cobalt oxide, lithium uh, cobalt uh, uh, nickel manganese oxide. Let's look at the cobalt price. And 2017, that's right there you see the price rise 3.5x, reaching $35 uh, per kilogram. This price is too high. That's why you see, you see recently all the battery companies say, let's go to high nickel MMC. Let's don't use that much cobalt because the cobalt is too expensive. We have limited availability of cobalt. That become an issue. Nickel price is about $6 per kilo. Not that expensive yet. But once we go to the large deployment of electric car, and moving into the grid using these materials, and the nickel's av availability, the price, could become an issue as well. Mm -hmm. Also watch for the copper. We use a lot of copper foil for the anode. If we use a lot more copper, we also need to watch that as well. So we, with that, we, we say, what well, is a strong motivation? Let's don't use those uh, metal. They can be expensive. They have limited uh, availability. Developing a lithium sulfur chemistry becomes attractive. Sulfur is everywhere. This, I believe this is a mountain of sulfur in Canada. So you don't know uh, 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 what to use this for. Uh, it's just piled right there. The, uh, the cost is uh, less than a dollar per kilogram. So it's so much cheaper. And this can offer you lithium ch sulfur chemistry, can offer you practically perhaps in the future, three times of the energy density compared to current technology. 
So I also want to touch upon lithium battery recycling, which the lithium uh, cost means the cobalt cost. You look at this basic structure. What are the valuable stuff inside the batteries? From anode, the copper foil. Copper is valuable. We want to take the copper out. Graphite particle, perhaps you don't need graphite. Graphite, we have a lot, a lot more. You know, uh, they are not uh, uh, worth to be recycled. Your separator is just polymer, polyethylene, polypropylene. So you can burn it. That's probably fine. And lithium cobalt oxide, right, has cobalt. This can have uh, lithium nickel oxide, have nickel. This needs to be recycled. They're, they're high cost stuff. And, and then aluminum foil, aluminum is cheap. That's OK if you don't recycle that. So these are the valuable stuff. In order to cycle your lithium back, you don't want your lithium and the charge is going to anode. You actually want it to return all the way back to the cathode. <coughs> they store in the lithium cobalt oxide. Then you recycle cobalt and lithium together. right? Um, so you look at the existing battery recycling technology. This is the one. First of all, when you collect these batteries, it might not in a discharge state. It could still have a lot of electricity right there. It could be dangerous. It's a, it's a bomb. So let's discharge that first. But you don't want to have a robot or individual to go connect it and show the batteries. So that costs too much. And the idea is, uh, actually, people are smart. They throw it into the salty water. The salt, salty water conducts electricity. You throw all the battery inside. Right? And then you can uh, discharge that after 25 hours. This, this part is easy to do, but the next part is so much harder. So how do you recycle that? <laughs> Once you look at that, I say, well, don't forget about it. Don't, don't look at it, right? So it's just too many steps. The cost is too high. The rough idea is you take the batteries, and then you break them into small pieces. And then you, and then you leach out lithium, cobalt, nickel, and then you separate them and uh, take them out. You use strong acid, and uh, you consume a lot of energy to recycle them. And the cost is too high. There's no a good way to recycle the batteries yet. I, charge my, uh, I, I challenge my students and also all the students sitting right there. You guys need to think about how to recycle batteries. This problem is coming very fast. Right? You know, Tesla's car. The first batch in a few years will retire. This huge number of batteries will be recycled. Um, we need to figure out this problem soon. There's a, a couple more questions I want to answer very quickly. We'll end my talk. So what about all solid state batteries? If you do that, you will make them safer. In principle, yes. Solid state can use ceramics. In the past <coughs> several years, a lot of progress made. People know how to make solid state. The iron conduction in solid state very fast, as high as liquid and even higher than liquid. So that's great. The challenging is interface, how to combine solid state with solid state with all this volume expansion without cracking. And also the solid electrolyte is very brittle. If you use ceramics, if you use polymers, certainly that's better. But polymers ionic conductivity needs to, to be improved. So still quite early, we will not be able to see solid state batteries and deploy in a significant scale and, and, uh, and any time very soon. What about fast charging? How fast can you do that? So what's the fast charging problem? You have anode, you have cathode. If you do fast charging, you push lithium ion electricity too fast. These uh, graphite anode will not be able to take it, the lithium, so fast. And there's also a term called overpotential is too high. You go through the uh, go below the zero volt versus lithium. You are going to pay out lithium dendrite. It will grow a dendrite and show your batteries. That's very challenging. So uh, uh, people have not figured out yet with fast charging. Unless you use other anodes such as lithium titanium oxide, the voltage is very high, and for the anode, the potential you can do fast charging, less than ten minutes. But you also lose half of your energy density because your anode potential is too high. Your full cell. And your full cell voltage is about half. Uh, so how do you maintain reasonably high energy and do fast charging? We don't know how to do. And Department of Energy recently ha uh, has a proposal call asking for idea how to solve this problem. So we'll see whether great ideas can come. 
What about swapping the batteries? Is this still a viable approach? Um, if we have too many electric cars on the road, we don't have fast charging. Our real estate price in Palo Alto and San Francisco will be too high. Um, we probably want to figure out fast charging or some type of swapping batteries. And the swapping battery, I think this, this idea is still not that. Uh, when I talk to the companies in uh, Beijing, they say Beijing real estate price is so high, there's no way they can, uh, having so many cars, swapping ideas, uh, this idea might be coming back. So what about other things? So the magnesium aluminum battery, you heard a lot about this, right? In the, uh, in the papers, in the news, this, uh, this is very exciting fundamental research right there. You have to remember, sodium ion is bigger than lithium. So that, that's a little harder to move sodium. Magnesium is two plus, aluminum is two plus, they're harder. But they do all for the potential. Sodium, magnesium, aluminum, they're a lot cheaper. What if the lithium become a problem? Then you should have this as a backup. I think we should do that. We should have fundamental research working on this. But the challenging right there, make sure you have to have the right cathode, right anode, right electrolyte and salt, the whole system for all these uh, new chemistry. They are not there. And this could take uh, many years before we get there. So uh, for the next 10 years or longer term, uh, for transportation, it will be mainly the world of lithium base batteries will be half of sodium, magnesium, aluminum to come in to make an impact. It will be still lithium. And there's a lot of room to improve the, the issues I already uh, uh, mentioned. And the opportunity is there, energy density, cost, life, safety, resource availability, uh, recycling. And grid scale storage, the opportunity are wide open. There's not a winner yet for the grid scale storage. It might be lithium. With uh, uh, such a uh, you know, uh, portable electronics driving force, electric car driving force, perhaps the lithium will go down to the cost very fast and get to the grid scale. Flow battery has a shot. And our new nickel hydrogen gas battery, this might be the one. Uh, the new chemistry showing great potential. This other aqueous solution battery also show, uh, you know, based on sodium ion, for example, might have the great potential. Well, let me end my talk by thanking the whole research group, uh, the support from uh, uh, many of uh, my collaborators over the years. And also locally, many of you uh, have been the either cheerleaders, and for example, GSAP have provided a lot of funding uh, over the years. And thank you very much for your attention. I will be happy to take any questions you have. Yeah, unfortunately, we're going to have to give up our AV equipment. We could take questions after. Let's take one or two very quick questions. Any student questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for really glad to talk. I have a quick question regarding the, um, the semi low battery for the uh, polystock body you mentioned about. What are the major challenges you currently observe for uh, the great scale deployment for this type of technology? Uh, there are majorly two. The first one is uh, the we still use the solvent that's flammable, either based solvent. Uh, they can burn easily and catch fire. Uh, the second one the, is uh, related to performance. Uh, the columbic efficiency is not high enough yet. We still lose lithium each cycle in order to get to a long cycle life, calendar life, with uh, a limited amount of lithium metals to start with, we still need to solve that problem. The, uh, the target uh, energy density of a battery ideally should go up by 2.5 to 3 times compared to today. And yet the charging rate is hoped to go down by an order of magnitude. But nowhere did you uh, reference any operating temperature inside the medium of the battery, which I imagine without proof can be fairly high. So. 
No, that's that's a question. You know, I think that the temperature issue has to be addressed, which uh, apparently is not yet. Secondarily, the addendum question has to do with the usefulness of using cryo EM to look at every structure. But I can imagine uh, that cryo EM is sort of okay. You know, to do post-accident analysis, but yet. What the image structure doesn't replicate the structure at the time of failure because of thermal uh, 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 conditions, uh, such as thermal motions and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what, what's the, what's the use of cryo EM uh, for for imaging, given those circumstances? Yeah. So, first question is the uh, inside the temperature of the batteries when you do fast charging. Um, that is an issue. Absolutely an issue. If you do fast charging, we all know if you do fast. The battery's uh, cycle life will be shorter because there's a lot of bad things happen. Uh, uh, we don't know how to solve that yet, so that needs to be done. And but I also take that as an opportunity. Maybe a great idea is if you want to do fast charging, try to tune your electrolyte fast charging at elevated temperature. The kinetics go very fast. Allow you to do fast charging. That might be an opportunity. So the second question is the cryo EM. Uh, looking at the freeze, uh, frozen structure, how do you use that to represent the dynamic process inside the battery? That's the, the uh, essence of your question. What we could do is, at a different stage of operation, you freeze that fast, you freeze that snapshot, and then put it into the TEM, the cryo EM, to look at it carefully. Now, and you freeze in this different stage, allow you to build up a, a kind of a semi-video to reflect what's happening. That would be my answer. Yeah. Great, let's thank you one more time.